Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us. My name is John Coleman. I'm the Dean of the College of Liberal Arts at the University of Minnesota. And it is my great pleasure to be with you today honoring CLA's 2020 Dean's Medalist. The Dean's Medal celebrates scholarly achievement, fearless inquiry, mentoring of colleagues and students, program building and public engagement being exercised at the highest levels of distinction. And all of those terms describe perfectly Professor Carl Flink. A professor of dance, Professor Flink's grants and awards include Emmy Award nominations, the Star Tribune's Best of Minnesota, City Pages, Best Choreographer and Artist of the Year, a Minnesota Dance Community Sage Award, two McKnight Artist Fellowships for Choreography, two Minnesota Ivy Awards, among others. The artistic director of Minneapolis St. Paul based movement theater, Black Label, Label Movement, Professor Flink's work is recognized for its intense athleticism, its daring risk taking, and its humanistic themes. Institutions that have presented or commissioned his choreography include the Bates Dance Festival, TED, TEDx Brussels, Theater La Dada, the Chicago Humanities Festival, the Minnesota Orchestra, as well as dance programs, including the University of Illinois, Stanford University, University of Iowa, Mount Holyoke College, and the University of Kansas. Professor Flink has participated in innovative work uh, throughout his career and indeed his, his own education, took a very innovative path through gender and women's studies, political science, law, and dance. His research collaboration with U of M biomedical engineer, David Odie is one example of his innovative thinking and creative work. The result called the Moving Cell Project fused the worlds of cancer research and dance using dancers to investigate how cells move through complex and mechanic mechanically challenging tumor microenvironments. Another example of his innovation is in the work we'll be, we'll be featuring today. As the world of dance grappled with the onset of the worldwide COVID-19 pandemic, Professor Flink began brainstorming and problem solving. The result is a dream of touch when touch is gone. Through his work, Professor Flink has brought together cutting edge interdisciplinary projects to life, to international acclaim. And to me, as Dean of the College of Liberal Arts, there was no more fitting way to demonstrate the appreciation of Professor Flink's colleagues across the college and across the university for all of this research, for all of his creator, creative work, for his passionate and careful mentoring of future scholars and creative and creators, for his departmental leadership, and for his cultivation of public engagement, performance, and knowledge than by awarding him the 2020 Dean's Medal. I was privileged and honored to be able to do so. We presented uh, Professor Flink with the award uh, last May in 2020 when we announced the award. And now we are able to have a suitable celebration of this achievement and this honor. So I now welcome Professor Carl Flink to introduce the film and to share a few thoughts and words. Thank you so much for this opportunity. And um, I'm looking forward to um, engaging our audience in, in this presentation today. So I, um, I'm going to dive on in here. So uh, welcome to everyone. Um, it's wonderful to be here with you. And before I do um, jump into the topic of making dance during the pandemic, I, I want to offer a couple of acknowledgments that I keep close to my heart um, as an educator and researcher at this institution, um, the in this institution which I have such a deep commitment to. These statements uh, help inform how I want to continue to work to make the University of Minnesota a place that all members of our society see as a destination for learning, research, community, and social justice. The University of Minnesota is an institution that has a history of participating in the systemic marginalization of black, indigenous, and other communities of color, 
consistent with the histories that exist in the Twin Cities, Minnesota, and our nation. As a society, we need to work to educate and hold ourselves and our leaders accountable for addressing and making meaningful changes in this institution, our larger communities, and in our own personal lives. I also want to acknowledge that the University of Minnesota and my dance program in particular is located on the unceded territories of the Dakota Oyate. And I honor this ancestral land also inhabited by the Dakota and Ashinaabe peoples. I stand in solidarity with those native communities whose land and labor are crucial in the creation of the institution that I have the honor of representing today. Thank you. So today's format is going to be a, a little different than your normal um, academic presentation. I actually have uh, three collaborators who will be joining me as the discussion goes forward. And we'll basically be having more of a conversation about this project, this film project that was created at the height of the pandemic long before any um, uh, vaccination seemed a real possibility. And so as we move forward, you'll see in, in, in the YouTube um, screen that you have that there's a, a place for you to comment and you're more than welcome to enter comments and ask questions as we go or highlight things that might've been said by one of the participants. So, and, and we will work to try to weave those comments and questions into our conversation as they make sense to do so. Want to give a little brief context for this presentation. Most of you probably are aware that when the COVID curtain came down in, in, in the spring of 2020, it basically brought a complete halt to so many of our, our, the aspects of our lives. But for live performance groups like my dance company, Black Label Movement, like theater companies across um, the Twin Cities and beyond, the work we do, the live performance, the dance classes, the, the, all of these events that required people to come together utterly and completely stopped. And these live performing groups were left grasping at straws. Do we just close down and go in hibernation? Do we start to take hold of the um, various possibilities that the internet platforms uh, provide so that we could do remote classes and films and things of that nature as a new way or another way to um, engage audiences. For my company, Black Label Movement, this change was particularly um, challenging because we're a company that is deeply committed to physical partnering. And so there was really no obvious way to bring ourselves back into a room to do the work that we do. And so it led to us doing a lot of soul searching. How, how do we exist? What are we going to be during this time? And how long is this COVID period happening? So I'm going to um, rewind just a little to the fall of 2019, when the folks from the 2020 TEDx Minneapolis reached out to me to ask if I would do a TED Talk. And I, I agreed, and at that time, we were gonna talk about kind of this high physicality of black label movement. But then the COVID curtain came down and the possibility of us getting on stage and doing a live presentation pretty much disappeared. And then Ted made a decision to fully put the conference um, online uh, for the fall of 2020. And so I stayed in communication with the team at Ted trying to figure out, is there something we can do? And finally, in June of 2020, we were going to have a conversation to decide what this project would look like. And honestly, what I thought I was going to do is go into that conversation and say, can we just put this on pause and wait for the TED in 2021? But I got on the call with the team and I realized as I was sitting there, I was thinking, TED is truly a conference about big ideas, about bold ideas. And, and, and it occurred to me, here we are, July, it's June 2020, we're in the heart of the pandemic and everything about live performance feels as distant as it possibly could. Is it possible for me to come up with an idea, a plan 
where we could come together, take our masks off and be in physical contact, do that realistically, but do it also ethically as the big idea that I would present in the fall. And so I, I said to the team, I would like to do a film that is about dreaming of being back in contact again, a dream of touch, when touch is gone. And that title, that's literally the title that ended up sticking. And the, the folks at TED loved it and they said, yes, let's go for it. And we all were really happy. And then we ended the call and I realized I literally had no plan. I, I had just committed to something that I had no idea if it was even possible. And so I kind of, I scrambled in my head saying, who do I know in the medical field who I might reach out to? And Professor David Power at the medical school came to mind because he and I have collaborated in a few instances. And I reached out to him in an email and I said, would it be possible for us to talk about a structure that would allow um, this to happen? Dancers to take off masks and be in physical contact. And David said, I'm not sure I have an idea for how to do that, but I want to introduce you to Dr. John Hallberg, who surprisingly enough, I had encountered 10 or 12 years before when Black Label uh, performed in his Hippocrates Cafe. So I'd like to bring John onto the screen now. And I reached out to John in an email and I said, hey, John, this may just be crazy. Can you conceive of a way where I could bring my company into a room for a film shoot where we're touching each other and taking off masks, doing that responsibly and ethically. And John, you, what was your response to that? <laughs> I think it was, uh, why not? Um, you know, I think by the time you reached out to me, Carl, I was already working a little bit behind the scenes with both the Minnesota Orchestra and the St. Paul Chamber Orchestra. And just by way of background, so that I have been providing care to the performing arts community since day one of my career, starting in 1995, right. when I used to work downtown Minneapolis. And so between the Guthrie, the Minnesota Opera, movie companies, um, the orchestras, uh, dance is an area I hadn't worked with very much. But I, this is just so much a part of what I do. And I can't think of another part of the economy, frankly, that was hit harder than the performing arts. Right. And so, I mean, more than the airline industry, more than hotels, more than bars and restaurants, it's been shut down completely by and large. Right. And so when we, when you reached out to me, uh, my first response is, this sounds really cool. What can we do to make this happen? And I feel like I have this obligation to the performing arts community to do whatever we can to um, get people back on stage in a safe, reasonable way. And, and one of the things that I really enjoyed about your response um, was you also said, if you had asked me this in spring, uh, when the, the COVID first arose, or, or first happened, um, you would have said, yes, this is crazy. We can't do it. And so it really was a timing issue. I was contacting you in July 2020. We know that Major League Baseball and other sports leagues were really starting to try to figure out a feasible plan, but we're but those organizations are also highly resourced in comparison, I mean, to many arts organizations which aren't in a position to kind of create bubbles and and uh, and and quarantine a whole community essentially for weeks on end. And so one of one of the challenges that we were facing is, could we do this? also in a way that was um, fi financially feasible. And how did that, you know, how, how did, as you kind of looked at the comparison to what you were starting to think of with the twins or even an organization as large as, uh, as the Minnesota Orchestra, and we we're talking more about a small arts organization like Black Label Movement, what, what were some of the immediate things that you were trying to, the, the operational items that you were starting to think about? Well, you know, at that point in the summer and leading into the fall, we started to understand, okay, so, you know, this viral infection is probably not spread through touch exactly. It's clearly respiratory. We had ways of doing testing. We kind of knew, okay, it takes a few days to sort of incubate. So knowing, like applying the science that we kind of knew at that time, 
with the ability to do testing, and we kind of leveraged the University of Minnesota's work on this and keeping in mind that we were doing about one third of the state's testing. And so we had this capacity to do that. I had permission and support of our Dean of the Medical School and the Vice Dean for Research. Um, taking a look at this you know, artificial bubble, well not artificial, but this very real bubble that MLB was doing, MBA was doing, right. um, you know, how do you kind of make these things happen? But at a nonprofit arts level, that would make sense, you know, for us to, to do this. And we just started, you know, started thinking like, okay, these are young people, they're not living together. How can we create um, a really safe way to do this? And knowing that everyone involved is so invested in making this work that I knew that we had, even not knowing any of the movers at the time, but knowing like the stakes are high. This is TEDx Minneapolis. How cool is that? Right. People around the country, people around the world are going to be, you know, learning about this. So we knew we had, you know, we were going to have their buy-in. And I think that, to, you know, to kind of create this protocol to do frequent testing the way that we did, we were able to make it work. And, um, you know, it just all kind of, came together. Well, and, and that idea of leveraging the, those opportunities, the fact that the University of Minnesota was doing so much testing, it, it gave us um, platforms that we could launch some of these ideas off. I mean, again, I think it's hard to really um, convey how, you know, the different resource deferential is between the MBA, MLB, and Black Label movement. And, and so we, 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 we had to be incredibly efficient with the ideas. We also had to ask the question of how do we do this ethically, right? We had a group in my company of 11 uh, Black Label Movement uh, performers. We call them movers. And they're, you know, yes, they're young people. Yes, they're very daring risk takers. And they're really committed to this. But how do we ask them to enter a space where, as you've said multiple times, as soon as you leave your place of shelter, you're taking, you're raising your risk of, of, um, uh, of contracting COVID. And so one of the things that I deeply appreciate is that <laughs> I, I think back into the early, early August where we had you on a Zoom call, I think that started at 9.30 p.m. Um, uh, with a, um, a very, um, and then we ended up talking with you for two hours and the Black Label Movers, we basically said to them, this is your time to ask me and John all of the questions you have to share your fears, your anxieties, your suggestions. And so um, one thing I really appreciated that time, and before we bring on a couple of the Black Label Movers, I, 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 how did you feel about you know, that experience of kind of being grilled, quite frankly, by, you know, by 11 really thoughtful and passionate movers? Well, I just thought, you know, it was, how else do I describe it? It was like this, I was, I was, you have this family in a way. And I was a member at the, I felt like I was at the, at the table with them. And they were just so um, inquisitive and kind and hopeful and adventurous. And it just, it was really an easy thing to sort of enter into that conversation. So tell like, hey, I'm on the same page. And I'm a physician and, and, and the very, you know, at the end of the day, I don't want anybody getting sick with this horrible disease that I've got colleagues who are in the ICU taking care of people on ventilators and right. people are dying. Right. And this is before we ever hit those thresholds of 400,000 or 500,000 deaths in this country, no, 700,000. Right. I mean, like it's almost mind boggling. And we were at a pretty low point there in kind of, you know, July, uh, August, September of like the, the, the numbers, nothing like we were gonna see in, in November. And so we, it was a perfect time to do this. Um, people were receptive. I was always wearing my sort of safety physician science hat, but you know, how do we make this work? And I should say, our dean Jacob Tolar. I mean, he is he and I are the same age. He grew up in Czechoslovakia under a under the communist regime. He is all about brave and trying new things, and yet doing it, you know, at, in the medical context safely and with prudence, using science on our side to to make that happen. And it was just the perfect blending of art and science yeah. and medicine and, and making making something beautiful out of a very not beautiful time. Well, and that idea that 
in this situation, the science or the art wasn't more primary. They were both kind of coming in as equal contributors to this substantive research moment. So yes, we want to make beautiful yet art. Yes, we want to keep people safe, but we also wanted to create a space where both participants um, coming to this were actually, there was something to be gained. And, and I think that if, if we highlight that as kind of one of the real keys and artistic um, science collaborations, which both you and I do quite a bit of, um, when you see both all participants kind of having real engagement of what they do, that's where it really can come to life. It's also worth just highlighting that all of this is happening long. I mean, we are starting to hear that va vaccinations might exist, but it was all, it all felt like a very distant possibility, right? So totally. we were really like, trying to find a, a, really some new 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 landscape to, to walk on. So I think I'll bring on uh, Rachel Miller and Eliana Vaselli. Hey guys, why don't you unmute? And um, and so uh, Rachel, why don't we, we'll, ha we'll have you go first. If you all could just introduce yourselves, give us a little more about you in terms of you're a black label mover, but what, what, you know, what else, um, you have also a relationship to the University of Minnesota, so. Go for it, Rachel. Yeah, hi, I'm Rachel. Um, I am a black label mover as well as an alum of the U of M dance program 2018. Um, yeah, that's me. Go ahead, Eliana. Hi everyone, my name is Eliana. I graduated from the University of Minnesota in May of 2020. So right as the pandemic was just uh, rapidly spreading throughout the United States, I studied dance, health and wellness promotion and biology. And this is my first season of Flat Label Movement. And we're so lucky to have both Rachel and Eliana um, with us. So um, for the two of you, there, so John and I have been kind of hatching this plan, right, in, in our head, and I, I sent you all an email, and actually um, we, we ended up having a Zoom call before we brought John into the mix to talk about this, and I, 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 it'd be really interesting to hear from both of you how you experienced being asked about the possibility of coming into a rehearsal plot pr process where you would take masks off and be lifted and lifting other people. Um, Rachel, why don't you start? Oh, I was like, this is crazy. This this is absolutely insane. We're we're gonna do what? Um, I like in my in this time period, I was very much staying home. I wouldn't even like go into grocery stores. I was very like in the stage of sort of like afraid to like do anything outside of my house that I needed to do. And so when Carl had approached us with this opportunity, I was like instantly excited, but also at the same time, very fearful. Cause I'm just like, I have not really left my house. What is this gonna look like? I have no idea. Um, but with Carl being Carl and like me knowing him throughout my entire college career, as well as like being a part of Black Label, um, he has always done a really excellent job and just like being there for us and like, if we're struggling with something or we're fearful of something or uncomfortable with something, he has been very excellent in like making sure we have conversations and that everyone's sort of like on the same page and like good to go. So I'm just like, okay, I'm extremely scared, but also know that Carl will take care of us and our family. So we'll figure this out. Um, yeah, that's kind of where I came from. Awesome. That's great to hear. Eliana. <laughs> Yeah, so when Carl first reached out to me about this project that was in collaboration with TEDx Minneapolis, it was exciting. I was definitely itching to be moving again in a space that wasn't my living room. And as an alum of the dance program, dancing was definitely a large part of my career goals after undergrad. And it was really put on pause as it was for so many others. Um, so the thought of dancing again was absolutely thrilling, but after that initial excitement and that initial hype of knowing that I would be able to dance again um, in a piece so soon, there was that question of, should we be doing this in a time when some of the world was shut down? Um, and so it did feel 
it felt I was definitely very fearful. Um, it asked the question of is it safe to be doing this? And as someone who studied public health, it definitely felt a little bit dangerous. Um, but there were just so many unknowns as well. And this wasn't something that any of us in the group had ever experienced before. But I also had a lot of faith in Carl and felt that as the collective company, we would figure it out and also navigate it. And a huge thank you to Dr. Hallberg for helping us make this happen. Um, we had the discussion that if we didn't want to continue with the project at any point due to personal safety reasons, um, even if we had already started the rehearsal project, then we went because our safety at the end of the day was a priority. But I also knew that if we could pull this off and create create art during the pandemic, then what would come out of it would be glori gloriously amazing. And the way that we would research, dance, and the way that art can be disseminated would be changed. So that's definitely where I stood at that point. Wow, thank you both so much for those comments. I mean, and I think one of the things that you started touching upon, Eliana, is while I feel a deep sense of pride that you all feel it, um, the faith in me <laughs> to to um, create a space that would be safe. Uh, it was so important that we create, um, that we move beyond faith, that we give you access to talking to John Hallberg, that we give you clarity about what exactly are we looking at here in terms of we're going to be doing three rounds of tests. After each test, what does that next, what does that mean in terms of what we feel comfortable doing? And, and that along the whole process, each black label mover knew um, that if at any point they felt unsafe or really quite frankly, their anxiety level just raised so that it was just too much. They could withdraw from the from the project without any any repercussions in terms of their relationship to the company. And we really tried to put like shift power from John and I as a leader and an expert and put it into in, into your hands. And it sounds at least Eliana that that was something um, that that you that 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 helped you in terms of finding your way into this. And I see Rachel, you you nodding to that. Do you have you know? How, how did how did that help you get to that point? Yeah, Rachel. yeah. Um, it just gave so much more comfort. I mean, obviously, um, as company members, we have a lot of faith in Carl. But I think having I think it was like a two hour like Zoom meeting. <laughs> so again, huge thank you to John just for allowing us to grill you with questions. Um, but it just brought so much more comfort, and it also like was very eye-opening um, on a lot of things and like what he was touching on, uh, what John was touching on earlier with like, it isn't necessarily touch, it's more of a respiratory thing. It like that just like sort of hearing that information um, repeatedly and like, again, all the grueling questions really just allowed us, at least for me, I'll speak for myself, allowed a lot of like calmness and be like, okay, like this is possible. This is a real thing. Yes, there's still some risk, but like we're gonna go through this process really strategically um, and like safely too. And I'm realizing like how quickly these things go because we still have a film to see and all those, but I do, uh, I'm wondering, John, if you could just, you know, a quick, um, you know, uh, minute, just kind of describe what actually these protocols look like for us. Yeah, I mean, I think we we started off by having everyone do kind of a soft quarantine so that because we, we knew that if, if you are exposed, it takes days to replicate to the extent that we can actually measure it. So we wanted everyone to kind of hunker down for about a week or so as best as they possibly could, started with testing, waited till we had the negative test results. You could then start to rehearse, but with masks on, then did another test and then finally knew that that was negative and they could take the masks off. And, um, you know, it was just, well, I was borrowing from what was happening in, at Major League Baseball. It was happening, you know, in different locations, different professions. So we already knew a little bit of that at that time and what we could kind of make work and, and, and make happen. So, um, but knowing that these are folks who are not living with one another, they have other jobs, they have to be doing other things, but how do we do it? So 
as you know, no bars, no restaurants, even if you could go to one at the time, like just logical things. If there's a way that someone could bring groceries to you during that time, that would be great. So just being very conscientious about minimizing exposure as much as you could, both during that kind of quarantine period, but then also as we headed into the testing uh, to do that. And, you know, I mean, here we are on the other side of it, it all worked and, and right. it was great. We had not a single positive test and, and you know, and, and art was made and, and through the use of science. Absolutely. And, you know, that rigorous three tests in the span of about um, six or seven days um, that uh, that gave us, it wasn't until after the third test that we, and, and that third test came essentially 36 hours before our shoot and then we got results within 12 hours of it, we're literally waiting for those results to see if everybody is COVID um, negative. And if a, a COVID positive test had come, we would have act actually had to shut down the shoot. And so um, that gave us that opportunity once those positive results came to say that when we get there on Sunday, we can um, do this shoot, take off masks, um, be in personal contact, Full, knowing full well during that whole process, whenever people were then out of touch with each other, there was a lot of hand sanitizing, putting masks back on. So it was there were still many protocols in place just really when we were doing the shoot, here's the chance. Um, I see a couple of uh, comments and questions. Susan, your um, question about, you know, what do we predict for the future of dance um, after, you know, having gone through this? Well, I think the one thing we know we're seeing is uh, remote learning is you know, hard in the dance field, but it's actually probably here to stay in, 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 in various aspects. It's a great way for students who've missed a class to make up work. I think I certainly know as a dance maker that I have loved working on films with my company. And so I feel like I've kind of opened a new door for another way to present this kind of work that steps out of live venues. And so I think you're going to continue to see those new pathways open. But I the the real big challenge right now is what where are we going to be in terms of live performance? Are people really going to want to come back into venues? How long is that going to take? And so I know a lot a lot of live theater companies, a lot of live performance in general is very nervous about how do we bring audience back. I mean I think we're seeing with professional sports that audience seems to want to come back. And so but I, but I, you know, but I don't want to assume that athletic audiences are are the same as a performing arts audience. Um, oh, um, Jane, thank you for that wonderful question. Um, during, you know, one of the things that was so exciting about during this process, and certainly because of my conversations with John Hallberg, we, um, the staff of the University of Minnesota Dance Program committed to having in-person classes this entire year. And so 90, all of our dance technique classes and dance making classes ended up being in-person, fully masked, socially distanced, but the staff of the dance program did Herculean efforts to make it possible for us to be in that those spaces all year. And um, we didn't have a single uh, COVID case traced to the activities of our building. So um, it, it, you know, now here we are in May and we're starting to emerge. It really was a success story because rather than students having to be online all year long, they were actually in person moving together. And, and I, it was truly an extraordinary gift. So I think we should get to this point where we share this film. Um, I, I wanna uh, say a couple things. Um, I had invited John to the the sh uh, shoot um, the, the day we did it, and he said, I'll, I'll come by for 45 minutes and see how it goes. And um, he ended up actually staying for all eight hours, and he ended up moving, helping us move ladders and, and becoming a crew member as we were going. And so I, I just wanted, John, just to kind of boot up the, um, uh, the film itself, to just what what was what caused you to just have to be there other than the desire to move ladders oh my god it was like so fun i when i first started practicing medicine in the mid 90s there were a lot of films being shot in the twin cities and i actually got to be like the set physician for a lot of uh, film companies and, and movies being made and i film is probably one of my absolute favorite forms of art and so to be on the making side of that and to see you guys in action and I mean, I had never seen the company. I met every one of them individually because they, and I should just, maybe this is worth people knowing. 
one of the things that that would make it, um, at the time nibble loose swabs. But I thought it'd be a lot more gentle and appropriate for each of the movers to do their own swab. Like they can control how you do it. It gives you as the give gave, gave the members a, an opportunity to kind of like take control over this sort of unpleasant thing. So I got to see all these different personalities and all these different people, like you know, through those three testing cycles. And by the end, I felt like, oh my gosh, these are like friends or it's like family or something. And to then see them like with joy on their faces and to see how athletic they are and how artistic they are, it was just mind blowing. It was so, so freaking cool to be there. I mean, to see a film being made and to see dance being made, it was in the space, Carl, was just incredible. And to see you when you're in this amazing kind of directorial way of that you have about you. Um, and, and people should know too that you had to be reminded that it was okay if you took your mask off because they really couldn't hear what you were saying when your mask was. And I was like, oh, Carl, you've been tested too. You could actually take your mask off. Uh, so it, was just this, it just was like this flood of emotion for me and this, this love of like watching art being made. It was just extraordinary. Kaylee, that's such a wonderful question. Um, I think we'll talk more about it after we see the film, but I, I think exactly what John was just saying is one of the reasons why these collaborations are so important. When you're crossing, you're, you're uh, crossing unusual lines in disciplines, there's a chance to shift perspective and experience life in a wholly different way. It's why my work with um, biomedical engineer David Odie really was transformative because Listening to Dave and watching him move as he talks about his um, research caused me to see connections between dance making and biomedical engineering. And and that when we can get out of our, our, our disciplinary silos in an easy and passionate and joyful way, it, it 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 makes this work much more connected and um and I think is has a profound effect on both sides of it. Um, some things to think about is we're actually going to share with you uh, an advanced screening of our new director's cut of A Dream of Touch When Touch is Gone. This film is being um, has been submitted to multiple um, film festivals across the world. But just in the past week, we heard from the San Francisco um, Indie Short Festival that we are a semi-finalist. So we're already seeing some excitement um, about uh, in terms of success with the film. Um, and we're hoping to see more as we move forward. But the but there's also the original TED version, which you can find on um, the, the 2020 TEDx Minneapolis, simply under A Dream of Touch When Touch is Gone. And that includes a film, at a, a little documentary making of film that can allow you to dive deeper into the process that came to bringing it together. But without further ado, um, we'll be we'll do we'll take some questions and answer uh, and, and offer answers um, after the film. But let's cue up that film and watch a dream of touch when touch is gone.
All right. Well, right away, um, I love those comments from uh, Winger. Um, we'll have to figure out, Winger, how to get you to a, 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 an audition and you can um, experience what Black Label Movement is um, all uh, is all about. Um, uh, please, as, as we go forward, um, don't hesitate to throw um, any questions you have or responses. Um, I love the comment also, Winger, about the camera work. And I, I'm, I'm actually going to throw this to um, John, Rachel, and or Eliana, whichever one of you wants to jump in. Um, this film is different from the one we originally did with Ted. And there's a significant change at the at, at, in the last third when we're all partnering together. And when you um, first saw these extended shots of, of coming in contact, what was, what was your response? You know, whoever wants to jump in. Um, I can jump in. It was the difference because I, I appreciated both, but for this director's cut film version, um, we were able to sort of, it, it was more immersive in a way where you were, you were getting to almost experience more on the inside, um, whereas Ted one was a little bit more from the outside and appreciating both but then again like you kind of almost like got to be in the adventure or just like experience from the inside and like follow dancers over here and then connect with another dancer over here or a mover um yeah it felt more like an immersive process um, whereas the other was like sort of a like a bird's eye view or just like an outside perspective nice eliana or john anything else to add there I would just add that I think that given the title of the piece, that this had a even more dreamy quality and and more, it drove home the idea of touch. And every time I watch it, I get a little bit different perspective, like just this, like in the heads of folks and people and thinking about like, hey, we're, we're in this time where we can't touch one another, we can't be with one another. What would it be like to do that and to drop the masks? And it just, yeah, it really kind of hits me more and more every time I, every time I see it. Thanks, John. I, agree, I agree with that. Um, I specifically in this cut of the version, um, it was, there was extended periods of touch and it just brought up so much um, from the beginning of the process where we were all very cautious and careful. And I think we we're all holding our breaths and, everything seemed very fragile and then after we broke that wall it was like everything you needed after not receiving that kind of touch for such an extended period of time especially with those that i mean we're a family so it was with people that we loved and it just brought all of that back and it became so familiar once again and i don't think we realized how much we missed it until we were able to do it again and that's really what it brought up for me yeah, in some ways, um, this this project felt like this bridging point because it literally happened in September, and now we're finally starting to really see some emergence here in May. It felt like a lifeline to me to be back in a room working with you all in the way. It's not that thinking about new ways to respond to the COVID restrictions wasn't valuable and exciting, but to have that opportunity to say, and here you're going to, I mean, the two of you in that those final images literally share this extended embrace as all of this action is just swirling around you. And I, and you know, as you're saying, John, this idea that each time I watch it, I go, oh wait, that was happening there. And it, it's just it 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 allows for kind of repeat viewings because there's just so much activity happening. And, and the, 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 the um, camera work that Ryan Stapara did was just extraordinary. And there's, th th and, and th there's this soaring, almost one minute long continuous shoot as he's moving in and among that madness with a, ca a camera and we're trying not to hit him. He's trying not to hit us. I think I had my hand on his back trying to you know, move him if someone was about to take him out. And so I think that that sense of um, of being brought inside really comes from that moment of camera work. And, and I think this goes back to some questions that were com some comments before, realizing that that's possible inside of um, a film that you can, that you can almost bring someone inside of it 
like you can get at a live experience, right? Because often film has that distancing effect because there's a screen, but with that way Ryan shot that and the way you all are performing it with such bravery, I think it brings us into the space. Um, yes, I mean, so many beautiful comments here. Um, I mean, Susan, that the comment about the face framing, I watched that sequence, how, I mean, I must be on 300 times and each time you, you see so many hands, you know, when, when we know that for many people, the only contact they've received are from the, the pets that they have in their lives, or there's those one or two people who are they're sheltering with, or, and we know that there's people who have just been in full isolation. And to suddenly see so many hands on so many different bodies in that sequence, I just, it, to me, it is the moment that I'm trying to communicate that we have to reach for this. We have to get back as human beings to touch. We, you know, we need to dream of it as we emerge. I mean, I know I don't want to, you know, it's not a comment on people deciding to continue to wear masks or anything of that nature, but this idea of physical touch is so quintessential to who we are as people that 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 the fact that John and the medical school and Ted allowed us to get to that moment that I call the tunnel of hands, um, that that was the gift beyond whatever art, you know, that, that comes from this beautiful film, that moment of connection, uh, I think helped all of us be a little more sane maybe, you know, in that process. So, um, yeah, I don't, you know, uh, John, uh, do you have any 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 other thoughts in terms of, you know, how how are we thinking of uh, emerging now? And and you you you're, you know, you've, just in this past six months, I think the medical school announced the new center for the art of medicine. So maybe you could just talk a little bit about, like, literally, this is a, you know what that project is about of how we're bringing medical research, medical policies, medical ideas together with art. And what do you see as kind of the um, the springboard that these uh, connections and collaborations support and what that center is trying to do? Yeah. So, I mean, I uh, we don't have a, a symbol or a identity for the center, but my friend, Dr. Robert Fish, who's a Holocaust survivor, created this beautiful diagram that shows two hands and one hand holds a pen, one hand holds a scalpel, and the caduceus goes between them. He does it inseparable, and it's very Taoist. It's very yin and yang. And I really look at that that way, that there's this inseparability between the art and science of medicine. And obviously, as a physician, you know, we're trying to bring these two pieces together. But maybe as important or more important, it's like, how do we bring it out to the community? How do we all engage? And I just saw a musician, a professional orchestra musician this morning who, you know, we're trying to get them back on stage. We're trying to get you guys back on stage. The challenge is going to be when are audience members ready to sit knee to knee, shoulder to shoulder, 2,000 people packing orchestra hall. That's going to be a, a tougher sell. It's going to take a while. We're going to have to gently kind of, you know, re-embrace that, gently get back into the, the stream of appreciating the arts in that way and not from our couch and, you know, watching a, yet another Netflix series or something, you know. So I think that's going to be a real challenge. But um, and, and there was a comment recently just about like the diversity of the movement. Remember, Carl, you guys talked about that earlier. I didn't know who your troop was, like who was, who was in this company. And my God, could there have been a, a better piece to put together at this time in this, in this sort of now post George Floyd world that we live in? And it's one of the, the focuses of our center now, too, is to increase the diversity of voices in, in medicine and in the arts and how, you know, everything has changed in this last year. I mean, everything has changed. And, I, and I'm really excited about that. It's a little scary. Um, there's a lot of new stuff that we're doing. Um, but um, yeah, so many, so many moving parts and, 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 and so much to think about. But, um, you know, we're excited. We're, we're ready for the challenge. So excited to c connect and see what happens at the center. Eliana, do you have any, you know, last thoughts? I mean, you, you've seen the film. You've seen this evolution. Um, you know, what, what, it, what, what, are, what are you experiencing now? Do you, you know, any reflections that came out of the, the process for you? Yeah, definitely. The I mean, from where we started and everyone, it 
we were it was there was so much unknown and so much uncertainty and look at what we made it's it's amazing that we get to share it with the world and i mean i wouldn't have um wanted to miss this opportunity for anything and i'm glad that we were able to do it in a way that was very safe and in a way that we felt very comfortable and that uh, we had cultivated an environment that was very open to communication and we did have to confront a lot of um, different topics during this period and we had a lot of hard discussions and I remember we had a very long chat at one of our rehearsals. Uh, we had all found out that we were, uh, we tested negative and we were all so happy and it was a, a weight off of our shoulders and there was this moment where we were like, should we hug each other? And then I think everyone took a step back because we weren't we weren't quite there yet and we had to have a discussion about it but it's amazing the process that we went through um and just the communication that we had and how we held each other accountable during the process and the trust that we created with each other as well thank you eliana rachel any la last thoughts to add to that at all yeah um i mean eliana has already spoken such beautiful words um but like a moment that I wanted to touch on of it was like the first time that we ever tried like the the face um, sort of touches and like embraces. And I, I want to say it was one of the first things that we actually did um, with masks on and like sanitizing and taking all those protocols seriously. But it almost like felt like I haven't seen these people in 20 years and we've been separated by whatever that is. And like, I'm finally getting to like embrace them. It like, like I almost kind of wanted to cry in the moment as simple as like a touch to the face was. It was like such like a beautiful like experience to have. And it felt just so like reviving and energetic and like nurturing. And just like, I wanted to, I wanted it to keep happening for like the whole day. Just like, please just like touch my face. Um, <laughs> not that like, that's a normal thing to do in public, but it was just like such a beautiful and like connecting moment. And like, it really set such a well tone for the rest of the process. And like it, that was sort of a solidifying moment for me that was just like, this is going to be some really amazing work that we're going to remember for the rest of our lives. Well, Eliana and Rachel, I don't think I need to say much more. Um, those were really beautiful statements. I think the only closing thought I really have is this film and this project that was so you know supported by John in the medical school and Black Label and all and, and the TED community. Um, it really is a physical argument for the value of emerging that we that at, we've gone through so much um, during the the COVID pandemic and we're still in it, but that we have these opportunities to start kind of coming out to touch and re finding those twenty year illusions of of distance. Um, is one of the things that I'm hoping that this film helps people see the value and the importance of this human touch. And so I want to thank everybody who came today. I want to thank uh, CLA and Dean Coleman for the opportunity. John, Rachel, Eliana, thank you again for being here and taking the time. I'm going to throw it back to Dean Coleman for any closing remarks that he may have. Well, I think I share the view of uh, the audience watching this event by simply saying, wow, that was truly spectacular. It was uh, an amazing piece of film. And uh, it was really quite riveting listening to the conversation of the creative process, of uh, both from the sort of very inspirational level of the ideas, uh, right down to the, uh, the mechanics and the logistics of, of how it all got done. So it was truly spectacular and uh, deeply, deeply impressive. Uh, I want to thank all of you again for joining us. I want to thank the, uh, the panelists who joined, uh, joined us today. And most especially, I want to thank Professor Carl Flink and congratulate him uh, for his uh, receipt of the 2020 Dean's Medal. Uh, Professor Flink was deeply uh, deserving of this award. And I think he got a sense today of why I was so honored and privileged to be able to present him with the 2020 Dean's Medal. 
So Professor Flink, thank you so much for all the work that you do and all that you bring uh, to the Twin Cities communities and to the uh, University of Minnesota. And again, thank all of you uh, for joining us today and participating in this event. Thank you.